All right, well, I'm going to say hello and welcome to everyone first. My name is Elise Parrips, if you haven't met me before. And this is Leanne Butterworth, our wonderful um, member engagement um, officer. Um, I'm the CEO of the Queensland Social Enterprise Council, and we're just um, very grateful for everybody's time. We know it's a really busy time, um, but it's always great to just sit and have some uh, focused energy on some of the work that um, people are, are doing in the space. And today we are delighted to be able to have um, Alex Hook and uh, Nina Yusupal from um, Social Traders with us today. Um, for our active learning lunch and um, as normal we like to start every session session that we do at um, the Queensland Social Enterprise um, Council with an acknowledgement um, uh, of country that we're standing on um, and for me today I'm at, in Kwandamooka country but our um, home base um, at the Queensland um, Business Centre is at the Turrbal and Yogara um, lands, traditional lands and um, we also really want to be able to stress that um, it's important that um, we acknowledge the role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, play within our QSEC community, as well as the broader community, bringing a real sense of reciprocity and sharing and caring for country and um, the traditional custodians of this, of this land need to be honoured and respected in everything that we do. So welcome um, to everyone here today. Um, Leanne, do you have any um, quick comments or um, uh, things that you want to quickly translate before we cross over to Alex and um, no. Nina today? Well, yes, I say no, I mean yes. Um, two things. Firstly, we do have other events coming up. So we do have Changemaker Tuesdays, which is every other, every other, other Tuesday. And our next active learning lunch is on branding. But the most important thing at the moment is our member survey. So if you're a member of QSEC, we really, really need your feedback into the member survey so that we can craft our activities for the next year so that we can make sure that what I'm doing is in line with what you guys need. Um, and the only way we can do that is through uh, member feedback. So I will put the link in the chat. So if you haven't already, and I know a couple of you have, which is fantastic. Um, if you could do that, that would be sensational. But hello, Nina. Hello, Alex. And thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having us. Oh, we're, yeah. super, we're super excited having social traders working with us um, at QSEC. And Alex and I say it's the Queensland way. And we really mean that. <laughs> we sure do. We, we have um, really forged a great relationship um, and we're super excited that um, over the last year, um, Social Traders has been able to support QSEC members with free certification for, um, so for QSEC members to Social Traders. Um, so we're delighted to be able to continue that with um, our strong partnership with Social Traders. And I'm now going to introduce the fabulous Nina Yusufpour and uh, Alex Hook. Um, to be able to talk us through what the hell is social procurement? And certification. And certification. <laughs> That's right. Uh, fantastic. Thanks for having us. And um, thanks for that really great acknowledgement of country as well. I'm dialing in from uh, Gubby Gubby land uh, here on the Sunshine Coast. Um, it is great to be here and just reiterating, uh, it's fantastic to work really closely with QSEC and, and see the great work and sector development that's happening. Uh, it is and, and has been for the last few years, uh, but it's a really exciting time in Queensland for um, social enterprise and social procurement. Just sharing my screen. And that's what we're talking about today, a bit about social procurement. And Nina is the um, all knowing certification um, boss, so I'll hand over her, to her to talk specifically about certification, but I'll just set the scene a little bit um, about uh, talking a bit about social procurement. What is it and what do social traders do? Why are, we, why are we here? So social traders, for those that don't know, we're an independent not-for-profit organisation uh, set up uh, in 2008 and over the first decade did a range of different things to support social enterprises across Australia. Um, we're including run an accelerator program, did a lot of advocacy, a bit of research, uh, ran an impact investment fund, uh, which Nina was involved in. So lots of different things. But a few years ago, the research really pointed to social procurement as one of the biggest untapped opportunities to generate positive, sustainable social impact in Australia. 
So our theory of change now, or the simplified version of it, um, really is that if we have business and government who buy a lot of things, if they shift a portion of their procurement spend to social enterprises, and social enterprises are there to respond to those opportunities, then those social enterprises will grow in size, number, and sustainability or business and financial sustainability. And therefore, they'll be able to deliver more of the impact that it is that they were set up to achieve. So that's why we have shifted our, our business model to, to solely focus on facilitating social procurement. So supporting social enterprises um, get embedded in the supply chains of business and, and government buyers. So what our model looks like these days, we certify and we support uh, social enterprises to grow. We then enable business and government members uh, to create positive impact by using these social enterprises in their supply chains. And we obviously advocate or continue to advocate and work really closely with QSEC in the Queensland context uh, to government and large businesses uh, to, to change their policies to support more social enterprise procurement. Uh, and in the work we do, we're looking to connect and, 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 and play the role to, to help support the, the connection between both sides of the market. So what is social procurement? Well, essentially it's when uh, social procurement is when business and government use their purchasing power to intentionally achieve positive social outcomes beyond the products and services they require. The reason this, this the graphic at the bottom helps kind of articulate this in a really important way. They're, they're buying goods and services anyway to deliver on whatever it is that they're trying to deliver on. What social enterprises do is they produce additional social impact, really valuable additional um, value in this equation, and that's social procurement. So I think one of the main things that we're, we're looking at, and Nina will talk a bit more about certification and, and what we're looking at in terms of trade or not trade, but when we're working with these bigger businesses and governments, they're buying goods and services anyway, what we're trying to do is change the way that they decide to buy things to include the positive social value that you create as a social enterprise in the equation for what looks like good value. So traditional procurement was really reduce the risk of the buyer, reduce the price for the buyer, and that's the decision-making criteria, and that's it. These days, there's many more factors, environmental factors, positive social impact factors like social enterprises can, can provide. And we're trying to help them change the way they buy things, change their systems to be able to include more social enterprises. So that's essentially what we're doing on either side of the market. We're supporting social enterprises to be seen as, as genuine social enterprises through the certification, which takes one step away from the buyers so that it's easier for them to know if they're working with a genuine social enterprise. And we're helping those social enterprises grow in a way that is um, targeted and um, relevant to those business and government buyers. And then on that business and government buyer side, we're helping them change the culture internally, train their staff, teach them how they can change their systems so that they're more likely to engage with social enterprises. So we're moving from either side, both the supply side and the demand side, to try and make more connections so that you as social enterprises can have greater revenues so that you can produce greater social impact. Uh, who do we work with? So we've got um, over 450 or 460 certified social enterprises nationally now, and we work with about 120 odd uh, business and government members. So. Um, this, or this isn't all of them. I just thought I'd talk for, through a few for the Queensland context just to make it as relevant as possible. But those 120 members are um, now four state governments. We work with Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, and now the ACT. State governments to change their policies and their approaches to, to social procurement. Um, a range of different um, industries from construction and infrastructure, which is a, a big um, a big portion of our membership, mostly because of the policy context in Victoria, but a little bit as a flow on from the Indigenous procurement policy, which was a, a 
federal um, federal government thing uh, to start with. Um, and so we have a couple of, I suppose you could almost put them into two, two schools of, in our membership. Um, some have been led by those policy changes, like the construction and infrastructure, and now they're starting to embed them in their systems and in their businesses more. So it's becoming more, you know, less push factors from, from their main customer, which would be government. And then there's another group that are kind of driven by those global movements around consumers and workers wanting more sustainable products, a better way of, of producing corporate social responsibility, a more integrated approach. So there's kind of those two schools, there's a little bit of overlap, a little bit of, you know, some, some are doing, you know, take drivers from both, both schools, but I suppose it just gives you a bit of context about why they're doing what they're doing. And so in terms of these, these key buyer members, um, you know, you see in terms of those kind of global movements, Microsoft would be one of those SAP and some of those bigger tech companies that have real drivers around reducing um, or, or having uh, an approach to, to community benefit and, and strategic, especially strategic integration of community benefit through the, the work that they do. And Australia Post is one that's kind of picked out some of the sustainable development goals and Transurban, I didn't put them on there, but, you know, other companies like that that are, that are um, you know, bit, uh, I suppose a bit bigger in size. There, there's more and more companies like that that are bringing a couple of the sustainable development goals um, out of the group and, and focusing on those. I think that Elise and I were learning when we went to Cairns that they should be uh, addressed as a collective, um, but that's not necessarily the way that, it's, that companies are, are going about it. So it's interesting to think about the drivers of these big companies and if you fit into those goals that they're looking to achieve. Um, or if they've published public statements around certain social issues that they are specifically going uh, to try and to try and address, those sorts of things are good hooks in terms of, of trying to find these. And Alex, if I could just jump in there too, I think you know it's a it's an education on both sides, isn't it? You know, when we For met sure. with you know um, Cross River Rail, for instance, they're sort of like, well, you know, how can how can we use social enterprises? You know, we're we're really um, working on construction, and when when you unpack the different kinds of things that social enterprises do, the, the services that sit alongside it, they go, oh, right. So you, catering and outfitting buildings and, um, you know, uh, landscaping and, you know, all of these other, um, all of these other opportunities start to un, uh, unravel. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And I think that's a really good example to kind of continue on with because it isn't just as simple as, oh, well, we've now joined social traders and now we're just going to buy everything we need from social enterprises. It just doesn't quite work like that or we're not at that point yet. We do need to be really purposeful and, and, and um, I suppose, relevant to these buyer members, both in timing and, and type of service to make it um, as easy as possible for them, which is why, you know, stealing some of Nina's content, but why we certify it helps the buyers use you more quickly. But the Cross River Rail, you know, we've got CPB, um, you know, they're, they're a great example. They were probably led to this by policy drivers. They're now rolling targets across um, their national organisation and they're the reason we're talking across River Rail because they've got some really great internal drivers and, and training happening. But when you're looking at Cross River Rail, there's a billion, you know, that their portion of the project is a bit over a billion dollars. They've only got a few years to spend that. There's general capability information or, or capacity kind of and, and delivery requirements. Um, they've got about 700 key suppliers, um, uh, you know, that they're going to be working with. It's hard to pick one of those out and put in a, a social enterprise. There'll be lots of different ways in which they're going to be able to engage in social enterprise. It might be down the tiers. It might be for certain ancillary things. Um, but there does need to be um, a bit of work in you know, finding how how those two scales fit together. You know, we've heard some of the social enterprises that are here versus that, you know, billion dollar spend over a few years. Um, there's, there needs to be, what we're trying to do is, is bridge that gap where possible. Um, the, uh, you know, there's the, the property companies like Lendlease, Mervac, when Nanda won the Social Traders Social Enterprise of the Year last year, we showcased the Mervac Nanda 
um, relationship from the Turnbull um, Shopping Centre. So there's a video on the Social Traders, Traders website about that if you're interested. Um, you know, Suncorp are obviously doing a lot of different um, great things in their community and we're working with them. Um, and they've, they've certainly uh, paved the way in terms of, well, for us, they've, they've done some, some really good Indigenous procurement initiatives and, and looking at how we can, we can expand that out to social enterprises as well is really important. Um, from the government point of view, both the state government, Queensland government have social enterprises listed in their Queensland procurement policy to, and, and initiatives you know, publicly stated that they're trying to increase spend with those social enterprises. So we've, we've, we've been working with them and the same um, with local buy we've been, as an avenue into all local governments in Queensland, we've got an arrangement with, with local buy to, to work on their new procurement system. Um, the other thing I just wanted to kind of showcase the different um, size and scale and, and, and focus areas of some of the, the social enterprises, so uh, sorry, of the business and government members. So we've got those big, big projects, CPB kind of um, uh, head or tier one contractors, then people like Boral, which is a, a concreting and um, company, they might be lower in the tiers. So we are seeing those, those in those bigger projects, different um, companies coming to us to, to try and engage more social enterprises. And then you've got the, the, the organisations like Griffith Uni who will be very place-based and very specific and they've got a UNIS social business centre based in Logan and so that will be where they are trying to, to drive positive outcomes. So there's just a bit of a mix of our buy members to give you a bit of a context, bit of context around. So we're looking at some of the government agencies, state and, and local, we're looking at some of those bigger companies um, uh, you know, like the Suncorps and Microsofts, but then we're in the infrastructure and construction space as well. There's a real breadth and diversity and, and, and we're, we're growing really quickly in the interest in social procurement. So um, we just had a session just earlier this morning with some of our newly certified enterprises and, you know, we're really, you know, um, emphasising the point to them that the more relevant we can make your product and service to those buyers and the more we can do the legwork to connect the dots between what you sell and what they buy, um, that's just all of that makes it um, uh, more and more likely to, to win work. So um, that's a very quick uh, run, run over of, you know, the people that the, the companies that we're looking at um, that, are, that are looking at social procurement, that are wanting to engage social enterprises a bit about the work that we do to, to help support and, and the reasoning behind, um, you know, certification being that first step for them to engage um, a social enterprise. Happy to take questions either now or, or at the end. We might just keep going and, and feel free to pop questions in the chat and, and Nina can um, keep going and we'll, we'll stop sharing. Um, after we've gone through this and happy to have a conversation about any of those things we've brought up. Yeah, sounds good. There'll probably be a few more after this as well. Um, thanks, Alex, for kind of setting the context around social procurement. And I know um, sometimes when you hear this stuff, it, it feels a bit abstract and sounds a little bit academic, particularly when we talk about terms like social procurement. But um, it, it's such a pivotal time, I think, in the social enterprise journey. And I've worked in the sector for almost 12 years now. And some of the things that we're seeing um, as a result of social procurement, we have never seen before. Um, and certainly, you know, this isn't something that just social traders is doing here locally. I think it's a global movement. Um, where, you know, in many countries, there is a recognition that some of the biggest spend and purchasing power comes from business and government all over the world. Um, and there's pressure on that spend to actually have positive social impacts because it's one of the pieces of the puzzle to solving some of the challenges that, the global challenges that we're facing um, as a society. And what's, you know, what is the kind of pivotal element for social enterprise is that it has started to be recognised in that conversation, particularly here in Australia. So the market has really signalled that it's taking social enterprise seriously. And, you know, sometimes in the day to day of getting your startup on, online or, 
getting things moving, it's hard to kind of think, you know, what's this big opportunity out here around social procurement, but it's good to have it in the back of your mind um, as to how you might be able to kind of have a piece of the pie and get involved as you do grow and develop, um, because we feel like this is just the, the early days um, and it will continue to evolve. And Nina, can I just jump in there too? Um, Social Traders and uh, QSEC put out a media release a, Q, a few weeks ago around the, <clears throat> pardon me, the Olympics in 2032. And you sort of think, well, that's such a long way away. You know, what are we doing thinking about, you know, social procurement um, with the Olympics? But some of the great opportunities that have come from social impact um, uh, with Olympics is around circular economy. So the, the medals being used, um, being re repurposed from electronics, um, the you know the podiums being made out of three D um, printed, like there's just so many different mm. opportunities for social enterprises in that space. And if we don't put our oar in now, they're going to start planning without us. So we sort of yeah. are, are working towards, you know, to to putting social enterprise on the map through that through that uh, opportunity too. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for bringing that up, Elise. And someone um, in our organisation at Social Traders circulated the other week um, what Paris is doing for the 2024 Olympics. And it was really interesting to have a read of that. So have a look at that um, if you get a chance. Um, but I guess in terms of certification, um, so the, the, the focus of the function is really to elevate the sector and elevate social enterprises. So in an environment where the marketplace is signalling it's taking it seriously, there's now policy that's including social enterprise. Um, everyone wants a piece of the action and we're seeing all sorts of things. Um, and there's social washing that's happening out there, um, similar to you know, what we've seen in greenwashing. Um, and we're seeing interest from a range of different models and businesses and entities and group structures and the, the mainstream as well that are now looking to the social enterprise model because they can see that this is in for the long haul and they're either going to need to change um, or they get left behind and some kind of view it as a bit of a tick box they see it as something that's a bit easy but we all know from you know trying to start a social enterprise or run one that um, it's not and so I think this, you know, eruption of interest in social enterprise is a sign of success of the policy, but it is also something that needs to be managed um, and we need to nurture the interest, but at the same time, ensure that it happens with integrity and protect the social enterprise brand. So that role of elevating the sector, elevating the social enterprises and, and protecting the brand is central to how we operate um, certification, but at the same time, ensuring that um, it is a process that's fit for purpose and fit for where the sector is at. So Nina, that's our... There's a couple sorry. of questions in the chat room too, um, just on that theme. So yeah. um, uh, Jeff put up, um, you know, have, has there been some documentation around um, the motivations and policy of, you know, what, what is it behind the drive for these corporate partners to, to get on board, which I think is a really important um, question. And also, you know, hand in hand, what is social washing? Yeah. You know, there's a real movement, I think, around wanting, you know, with climate change and, um, you know, the particular um, <clears throat> social, intractable social problems that are occurring. There is a real movement for change and people wanting to make a difference. But rather than doing a corporate social responsibility light touch, I think that's, you know, that can come sometimes, you know, be, be mm. driven as the social washing, that light touch, whereas social enterprise really tries to drag that down to the purpose, yeah. the core meaning behind it. Do you want yeah. to respond to those questions? Yeah. Um, so, Candice, I'll respond to yours and I'll let Alex um, take the one from Jeff. But as social washing, so it's happening in many, many different ways um, and ways that have surprised us, I guess. Um, so the obvious one is, an is a business kind of, you know, posing as a social enterprise where it's not. And that's why we have certification to try and avoid that. Um, but there are also instances. So if I talk to the examples of in the Indigenous space, um, it's rife with it at the moment, they call it black cladding, where um, businesses are signing up to joint ventures with um, Indigenous businesses. 
um, to be able to kind of deliver on larger, you know, pieces of work or to have the kind of capability, but it's really just a bit of a front for the, the mainstream business. And that's what we're trying to avoid in the social enterprise space. Um, but there is also, you know, there are instances where people are trying to partner with social enterprises, leverage the brand, leverage the impact, collaborate on tenders, but then circumvent the tender. Um, so there's all sorts of things that kind of happen. Um, and I think it's just natural when you have policy that this stuff takes place and we don't um, propose to solve all of it through certification. We're identifying genuine social enterprise, enterprises and we've got some recommendations on how corporates could navigate social washing um, when they're looking at tenders. Um, but it's something that, you know, as best we can through certification, we try and mitigate. Alex, do you want to jump in on Jeff's? Yeah, uh, it's probably, I'll try not to talk for too long about it. Um, I think that it's a, just an ever evolving space, Jeff. So we talk to some key drivers um, quite often, like the Indigenous Procurement Policy in 2015, the Social Procurement Framework in Victoria, um, the Modern Slavery Act in 2018 really highlighted the responsibility big companies have over their supply chains, the SDGs as well. Um, big statements like the you know, um, funds managers like BlackRock about social returns as well as financial, uh, social returns as well as financial returns. So those kinds of drivers, every company, you know, aligns it to different strategic plans. There are different key strategic drivers that each of them use. There was a um, report released last in the last few weeks, the state of social procurement. Um, it was commissioned by IPA, the big recruitment social enterprise that's owned by the disability charity uh, GenU. Um, they commissioned a report that the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply supported with social traders uh, and Akina in New Zealand. So that's a pretty good place to start if you just um, Google that or it'll be up on and out the website, the social traders website is being relaunched tomorrow. I think it's tomorrow. Yeah. Um, uh, so there'll be more information and links to some of those key things, but I suppose, you know, um, that, yeah, that, that report is probably the best um, current collation of, of drivers. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Alex. Um, there's a couple of other um, comments in the chat there, examples of social washing. Thanks for that, um, Mariel. Um, and Candice, would it be an idea then for smaller startups who are interested or think they're operating as a social enterprise? Yes, and, and we'll, I'll get into responding to that in a second. Um, but just in terms of elevating social enterprise, we, we have had the question sometimes why I focus on social enterprise? Um, because in reality, all businesses have impact. Um, but I think with social enterprise, what we're trying to identify is where a business is operating with a primary and primary being key, social purpose. So that's the reason it's established to solve a specific social, cultural or environmental issue. There might be private benefit and gain alongside, but it's the purpose that takes um, priority over other things in the business and they reinvest um, you know back into that purpose in a way that the public or community benefit outweighs the private benefit so you know for all those that are operating a social enterprise you know that when you're trying to operate a viable business and um, and also achieve your mission you're balancing the money and mission tensions which always creep up um, and sometimes decisions on one side around business viability will have an impact on the mission, um, sometimes negatively and also vice versa. And that's something that we constantly manage in this space. Social Traders itself manages this all the time. Um, and so we know that in that challenge, um, there's often additional cost to running a social enterprise because you're addressing, you know, disadvantaged, marginalised communities, underserved parts of the market. Um, and it's, a, you know, who bears that cost? Sometimes it's customers, but not really. Um, sometimes it's funders and government. Um, it might be investors, but oftentimes it's the social enterprise themselves. Um, 
and we know from local and um, global research that social enterprises have difficulty to kind of access the resources, the capital, access to markets, which is what we're talking about here in social procurement. And that's why we have certain initiatives um, like what we're doing um, around social procurement, like what QSEC's doing um, to, to elevate um, and support the sector really. Alex, next slide, thank you. Um, so in terms of our approach to certification, and Candice, this might go some way to respond to your question. Um, we, so I think sometimes when people hear the word certification, they think, you know, compliance, black and white, you're in or you're out, um, hard and fast rules. Um, and I think that's something that we've done a bit differently. Um, with our certification and maybe not something that we've communicated so well at times because we still get some of the myths kind of creep up around oh it's just for small it's just for larger organizations or doesn't include startups or or whatnot so i just wanted to kind of go through our approach to clarify maybe some of those points for you um, what certification is doing is saying whether a, a, a business is operating as a social enterprise or not, it's not a mark for business excellence. Um, that would be, that's a whole nother kind of kettle of fish in terms of due diligence and, you know, some of our buyers that might be working with social enterprises in, in a significant way might just do their own checks around um, viability. Um, that's not what we do. Um, it is certification applies to all legal models um, and there isn't a legal model for social enterprise in Australia. And I think that even if there was, just like in the countries that do have a legal model, social enterprises would still employ the full gamut of structures that are out there from trusts to, you know, some estate government entities, um, your traditional not-for-profits and other private companies. Um, it's for all stages of development, so everyone from startup to established. Um, we've had startups that have won their first contract um, through um, through being certified and connecting to our buyer network. Um, the only uh, stage that it it isn't suitable for is if you're still in proof of concept. So we don't certify ideas, that's very hard to do. An idea can shift within a month. Um, so we wanna know that something has been tested. You don't have to have started trading. Um, it's nice if you have, but we can kind of work around these things as long as the idea is pretty well formed. Um, and all impact models. So social enterprises, I think everyone in the room here is doing very different things. Um, it covers, you know, all, all of those different areas, not just for larger organisations. Um, we, I think the approach that we take is it's developmental. Um, we evolve our framework to kind of um, meet the way the market is, you know, the ecosystem and market is changing as well. And we've got a team, a small team of people um, that have quite deep social enterprise experience. So we kind of talk through your model with you um, and support you through the process really. The criteria are based on the phases definition, um, but we have operationalized the phases definition to readily be applied in an assessment. So that means issues that um, you know people have kind of come up against in terms of this strict you know 50 percent of profit reinvestment but you know that's not our model what does that mean um, we we look at that differently it's not word for word applied um, there's a lot of flexibility that we provide in terms of revenue from trade as well so i won't go through the phases definition most of you will have come across it in some shape or form um, and you can kind of jump on our website to have a look at, you know, what that is, but more so look at um, probably our um, certification site and I'll put the link up um, on that soon. And we also have an independent advisory group. So where there's complex applications and increasingly we're getting more and more of those. So transitioning businesses, large group structures, um, if anything is going to set a new precedent, um, it will go to our uh, advisory group for independent review and advice. Next slide, thanks, Alex. So when um, we certify, there's a, 
a few documents that we collect. Um, and so for startups, it's usually um, legal documents and that varies depending on your legal structure and what you have and don't have, um, as well as financial documents. If you do have financial track record um, and a basic you know, business plan and forward kind of budget. Um, if you are early stage, if you're more established, it's two years of financial statements. But the focus of our assessment is really in um, the proof point for the primacy of purpose. And it's around being able to articulate what your impact is. So this is the part that we spend the most time with, with an enterprise. And we kind of, we help you peel out, you know, what are your headline impact activities? So what are those things that you do that mean that you achieve, you know, that primary purpose? And associated with that, there will be direct costs, um, or you could look at it as your investment into the social purpose. So we look at those, um, and we look at a few indicators of impact across um, three key models of social enterprises. So while you know your missions are all very diverse, and you could kind of look at these three areas and peel off a whole bunch of subcategories, we usually look at social enterprises in one of these three and sometimes operating across a couple. Um, the first is, you know, employment or training for disadvantaged um, people um, and important in this model that differentiates a social enterprise from other businesses that might be hiring disadvantaged people anyway is the kind of wraparound and ongoing support they provide to, to people based on, on their specific needs. Um, the second is community need. So it's usually um, delivering a more accessible product or service that's not met by the mainstream market and is targeting a specific community of need. Um, and this is very diverse. It can be anything from a consulting business that's consulting to not-for-profits at a discounted rate by cross-subsidising that with um, you know, corporate fees, or it could be a public space that's run by a not-for-profit could be a community wellbeing program. So lots of variation here. Um, and the third is your kind of your traditional profit redistribution model. So this is where that, you know, 50% of profit reinvestment does come into play. So your who gives the craps of the world um, that are exploiting one market um, so that they can channel um, as much profit as they can to a specific charitable purpose. So I think we're pretty much at the end now. Um, I, I haven't gone through the details of the process of certification. Um, that I think tends to be um, a little bit boring in a session like this, but more than happy to take that offline. Or you can go to our website, um, have a look at the certification page. Um, also take a look at the certified enterprises that are currently there. So we have the Social Enterprise Finder now, um, and that lists all the enterprises that are currently certified. So you can see the diversity. Um, and I, in that last slide, we've just got, I've got the certification email up there. Um, you can kind of email us with any questions. Our website is a new brand, like Alex said, is going live tomorrow. Um, so there might be a few bits and pieces missing on the website, but if there's anything that you can't find, just reach out to the certification email or myself or Alex. Uh, Peter, I just, just went back to this because uh, there was a question in the chat from Barbara about what level of testing. Um, and so you probably talked to the points um, uh, but it'd be good just to wrap that up into an answer to Barbara's question. What level of testing do you prefer to see when it comes to pre-trading social enterprises? Yeah, um, and proof of concept, it looks uh, it looks different. I mean, there's your t traditional proof of concept where you kind of go out and you test the market, you survey, you might run a pilot, um, you might... Um, you might sign up partners or you might have a list of customers, whatever it might be. And then there's other instances where we have certified enterprises based on previous experience. So the founders might have operated a similar business before or they may have been um, a social worker and now they're bringing that together with um, a commercial capability that they've had in a previous life. So I think what you're saying there, Barbara, um, 
you know, having a minimal, minimal viable product, yes, I think that's you've started to pilot and you've started to actually understand what the demand um, for your product or service is and you're potentially kind of pretty soon ready to roll and generate income. And I think what certification would, would look at, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Nina, but you know, having that business plan that is well thought through and there is some logic behind what it is that your, your MVP is made up of and that there is some evidence behind that traction or the, the response you've got from sending out those concept packages, that flowing into some financial forecasts, which you can start to look at where your impact costs might be going, looking at what your trade revenue will be versus what, you know, whether or not you'd be just reliant on donations and grants. So it's just that logic and the thinking through what is mm. more than an idea and is now a plan that's about to be implemented. So I think that's the, you know, the practicalities of it. Yeah, and oftentimes, um, you know, we do have some startups say that uh, it's difficult to pull that together. Um, we're not looking for a 20 page business plan or anything that's overkill. And in fact, you know, how often do business plans end up <laughs> resulting with what they've projected? Um, not a lot of the time, but a lot of this information is usually in, you know, the entrepreneur's mind anyway. So it's basically having your thoughts down on paper so that we can kind of record the evidence and it's also, you know, the, the process of just documenting it, I think, is, is often quite beneficial for a social enterprise as well. And we often get at QSEC the question, what's the difference between a QSEC member and a social enterprise, certified social enterprise through social traders? Um, you know, the, the most important differentiation is that, you know, we're almost like the family of social enterprises and we connect and engage and help people along their journey create um, conversations to really draw people in. And procurement is one side, what like one part of the whole of the structure, um, you know, and we support all of the different parts of the structure through what we do. And Social Traders is one of our, you know, we, we can't do everything. They specialise in that certification area. So we hand that off to Social Traders. Thank you so much for doing all the hard work. Um, we'll get back to, you know, building those conversations, building those connections, talking to government, working out what social enterprises need next and really helping to form that connection piece. So I think that's the beauty of working with social traders is that we've got, you know, both of those aspects covered off. Mm. And, and I think that we can't do it without uh, QSEC. And, and today's a good example for those in Ipswich or Townsville, like my, my ears, uh, um, prick up because when buyers come to us in those areas and we don't have sort of we don't have certified enterprises we work with our with our local um, networks and and you know I call the lease and say but you know who's around who are the local champions what are people doing in that area you know can we start to stir up some activity in these different regions and bring people together so that we can all find out about the interesting stuff that's happening um, because it's a bit chicken and egg for us. The buyers say, oh, there aren't any certified enterprises, so why would we change the way we buy things? And the enterprises say, oh, there aren't any buyers looking for us in our region, so why would we certify? So, you know, we need QSEC to be doing this market building work um, to feed into what might be opportunities down the track. The other thing to keep in mind, hello, everybody, is, um, and Nina said that some of the certification really nitty gritty she couldn't get to, but in the online learning center, social traders actually built us a course specifically about social procurement and certification. And it goes into a lot more detail about certification. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, thank you so much to Alex and Nina for talking us through social procurement and certification process. Um, we're really deeply indebted uh, to you guys for the work that you do. Please, if you are a social, if you're a, a social enterprise member of QSEC, please make sure that you fill out the survey, the annual survey. This is a critical piece of information that we need to take to government around the kinds of value that you're creating on the ground, what kinds of jobs you're creating, what kind of impact you're making in your communities, so that we can, and what are your needs, so that we can really put ourselves right in the frame and try and address some of the needs of social enterprises as they emerge. 
So I'm begging you, please, please use the link in the chat room and uh, make sure that you get your responses to us ASAP. Um, if the other thing is, if there's anybody here who's not currently a, a QSEC member, I know I see a couple of names that um, I'm not sure. Um, if you would like to join today, you can use the code QSEC friends and that will give you 50% off your first year of membership. So, and, and if you're a QSEC member, it's free to certify. Um, so for those who are interested in certification, year, that would be great. So Alex, you get your first year free, isn't it? And then uh, we had first term free. Yes. So okay. what's it? Because you could, uh, if you you could certify for two years, um, if you meet a slightly higher standard, just you know, uh, audited financials uh, is essentially the main difference. Nita, just jumping up, I'm saying one thing. <laughs> so if you're um, a startup, we certify you annually, and if you've got more than two years of trading, you can you can get two years of certification. So the free period is for whatever term you're eligible for. Well, there you go. Thank you. Yes, super, and super exciting extra set of steak knives there. Thank you very much, Elise and Leanne, for coordinating this. And thanks, everyone. Um, it's, I think it's a really good turnout for a week after <laughs> lockdown. And I know that it's a difficult time for everybody. So just want to acknowledge that, you know, some of us have a lot going on. Um, and it's nice to just see everyone's faces and connect and you know, chat to you, Elise and Leanne as well, and um, hopefully see you in the office soon. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks you, everyone. Alex. See ya. I think definitely you should join if you're a social enterprise. Join us. We are a fantastic bunch of social entrepreneurs. I'd be looking to join an organisation like QSEC that could really advocate on my behalf. And it's really nice to meet other people that feel and live and breathe their work as well. You're not alone. So at the moment there's the Gold Coast Network, we've got the Sunshine Coast Network, um, Toowoomba, Logan, um, there's a Brisbane network and then of course all the regional centres. When, when I do get a chance to stop and take a breath and look back on what we've achieved, there is definitely a sense of pride. I want to make a bit of a difference to a, somebody's life. didn't ever expect to make a difference to my own life.